Well, this morning, if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, it's the book of Haggai. Yes, common church message that we're all used to. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm totally kidding. Actually, you will recognize it, but um, some of what I want to do this morning is restate the obvious. I, I have told you that uh, my brother and sister, uh, Jess and uh, Corey McGrail, took uh, my first Bible when I was a new Christian. My mother had, actually, my mother had bought me the Bible at my request. I don't know what I was thinking. I was a non-Christian. I told you my story. And um, I said, maybe you could get me a Bible for my birthday or Christmas or something. She got me this old King James Schofield edition. Anybody remember those? Yeah, who can forget? Uh, Schofield. Actually, I learned a lot from it. Some things I don't agree with anymore in it, but I learned an awful lot. And so they graciously re got it rebound for me. And uh, it's wonderful. And so I'm working my way. This is the second time now I'm rereading all the way through. And I start at Genesis, and I'm up to almost the end of the New Testament. I'm in Zechariah. And just before Zechariah is the book of Haggai. And as I was reading along, Something jumped off the page to me, and I uh, went back and checked this morning and make sure my memory wasn't off, because sometimes it is, and uh, it wasn't off, that when I came across Haggai, chapter one, this is not the sermon, this is extra. This is extra, okay? I promise I won't keep you till two o'clock, so, and if it uh, starts raining, I might shoo you home sooner, who knows? Haggai chapter 1, and there's this, uh, if you have a Bible, you can look there. Verse 7, I came down to verse 7, and uh, verse 7 says, consider your ways. Ooh, don't you hate stuff like that? What hit me was verse 4. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? And I looked at the bottom, and I'm going to include this in my message, but now I've given it away so you can all, like, I can close in prayer and we can go home. But Schofield mentioned Matthew 6.33. Who knows what that says? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And every other issue will be solved, basically. He said that verse is relevant in every generation. Great line at the bottom of my Schofield. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. Okay, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the worshipers that have come this morning. In spite of the threat of the weather and the drama of COVID and everything else, thanks for those who are perhaps on Facebook or going to catch up on YouTube who are earnestly worshipers of you that want to give you attention and want to hear from you. And, uh, but Lord, we're, we're looking to you today because we acknowledge we're the ones in need. You're the one who breathes life. When you speak, things come into existence. You call out of nothing and things become. And Lord, as uh, followers of Jesus, we recognize so many times... Uh, how much we need you to breathe life into our situation or call into being things that are not yet. And I was pondering when uh, Pastor Tim said, I guess the question today is, who is Jesus to you? I actually parked on the next verse, which said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and vice versa. And I'm thinking, whoa, how many of us have felt that happen lately? And when I ponder uh, my tenure at Harmony, I feel like uh, there are so many wonderful truths in your word, and I feel like we have a carrot hanging out in front of us, and I wonder, are any of us rabbits? <laughs> Do we want to chase it and chew it up? Lord, we want to see your spirit at work, and uh, we need your help. And so today, as I simply really don't speak anything that much profound as much as it is by way of reminder that your Holy Spirit would help us this day. Help us to hear, give us ears to hear, in the great name of Jesus I pray, and all of God's people agreed, amen. amen. And if you're not his people, you don't have to agree. 
Um, you know what, I had, a, I had a joke. My wife's gonna, she may be watching up in Albany. Hi, honey, and uh, family. She's uh, helping with grandkids this weekend. She also got away from me, which was probably a relief. And uh, I had a little joke going, and my brother, my, my, you know, at my last church, Jim Whittle, I used to have a, uh, a probation officer. I called him my probation officer. I can't say that here. But I do have a... Uh, you know, a, a state policeman that keeps an eye on me. And a while back, I asked him for a gift. I said, do you have an old bulletproof vest I could have? Because I knew last week I was going to make an announcement. I had no idea what was going to happen. And to be perfectly honest, with the dead silence of the last week, I thought about wearing it today. I didn't know what I was going to be walking into. So, um, yeah. Uh, Silence is deadly sometimes, you know. I'm wondering, what are they thinking? And are they mad at me? Oh, well. So, on we go. The name of my sermon today is Build My House. This is a standalone, and it kind of makes up for the fact that with COVID and all the crazy things that have happened, uh, Pastor uh, uh, Derek leaving us, we had a weekend for that and, and uh, different things. And by the way, I think we're going to have one of our missionaries who represent us in Africa next week. Um, I never did have a formal state of the church address. I don't really need to give much of one because what happened last year? COVID hit and felt like the whole world shut down, right? Things slowed down. And a lot of the things we felt that we were moving toward kind of got pushed back on a bit. So that's what I want to encourage us, that as things lighten up, when they eventually get your shots ready, I'm 70, I should have had one already. Now, everybody chill, okay? <laughs> Just, it's a joke. You know, it is what it is. And uh, we'll trust the Lord and we'll go through it. But when things settle down, we don't want to become so used to the COVID couch potato syndrome that we rise up again and be useful to God, right? Amen. I mean, churches should be. So I want to talk about build my house because it comes out of this passage in Haggai. It hit me. I went, boy, there's a, that'll preach. You know, I just happen to be reading my devotions. See, if you read your devotions, maybe you'll preach next week. No, well, I'm getting shake, shaking heads at looking at it. Here's where I want to go. A little further down, it goes like this. In chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, let me read this passage to you. And if you have your Bible open, it's only two chapters. How easy can it be? I will shake all the nations. They will come with the wealth of all nations, a line that was uh, borrowed for a book years ago. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I shall give peace. Shalom, declares the Lord of hosts. Well, I heard some amens during that. I like having the little flock here worshiping. That's good, right? We worship with song. We also worship in the word. And that's what we're doing. So my reading triggered this, and I thought this lends itself to just a, a, a reminder, especially two things that we've talked about that must not be backed off from. Must not. As I'm uh, thinking about this year that's coming ahead, and by the way, I'm still here, and I got all this junk up in my head. Feel free to download as much as you want. I get people writing me questions, some really good questions, Shirley. I'm not picking on anybody. And, uh, and several others, uh, Joe Barra, he was another one. He's been reading the Old Testament and asking me these cool questions, and I'm going, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> now I do my best. So I've got all this stuff, uh, so make use of it. And um, here's what we find. The first thing I want to do is explain the context of Haggai, just for a second, for those of you who may not be aware of it. You remember that the children of Israel were a naughty group occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> my favorite line, I, I won't put anyone on the spot, my favorite line from Christians is, can you believe those people in the Old Testament? That's my favorite line. It's like, oh, yeah, baby, I can totally get those people in the Old Testament. You know why? Yeah, thank you. I don't have to fill it in, right? 
I say the same thing, right? Do this. Well, no, I think things change now. God doesn't mean me. <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, so they got in trouble. And eventually, God had had enough. He said, I'm going to have to get your attention once and for all. And by the way, it worked. God took them into captivity, first in Assyria, then Jerusalem ended up in Babylon. Remember, they're incarcerated, if you will, transported, removed from their land. Everything fell apart. And um, they were ultimately, finally cured of false worship. They were cured of little idols. That was done. So much so, the pendulum. Remember my pendulumitis syndrome? Went from worshiping idols to not listening to God himself when he showed up. But it worked. Out of his great love, he disciplines. And so in the Old Testament story, they are released by the promise of God who said to a prophet, and th th you can't get around this, it was written years before it ever happened, 70 years in Babylon, and then you're going to come back. Cyrus the Great is going to release you. You're going to come back. They come back, Ezra, Nehemiah, all those people, and a bunch, thousands of, especially Levites and priests, came back and settled in the land of promise again, but that one of the things they needed to do was rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. And so they start to do that. And some of the drama was as they laid the foundation, there were older priests who had seen Solomon's glorious temple. I'm gonna show you a picture. This is Herod's temple. Herod took this one that they were rebuilding and really decked it out and kind of made it look imitational to Solomon's. It was glorious. Remember Jesus and his disciples going through the temple? They're like, wow, look at these great stones. Isn't this amazing? Remember? It was a fabulous thing. And Herod did it for political motive, but it was pretty spectacular. So when they were building and they laid the foundation, they were getting started, there were some older priests who remembered Solomon's temple. And when they saw this, <laughs> this, this is terrible. What a rotten place this is going to be. Yeah, this is so sad. It was so beautiful before. Look at this. This is like moving from my house in the country, you know, into a one-room apartment. Blah, blah, blah. That's, that's kind of what they were doing. And so when they saw the little humble beginnings of that, they're crying. And he says, listen to what I want you to hear. You think this is bad. You, you remember the old glory, and you don't think this is all that impressive. I'm telling you, I'm going to fill this new temple with glory, no matter how small it is. And of course, how did that come to pass? One day, God came into the world miraculously in the person of Jesus, I hope you guys understand that Christianity, if you think you believe in it, it's all about that person. It's not about churchianity, it's about Jesus, about a relationship with him, the go-between, the one who brings us into relationship with the living God. And he shows up in this Herod's temple. You can't fill the temple with any more glory than God himself. But there's more in mind that God has in mind. I shall give peace in this place. And the Prince of Peace came into that temple and then died outside the gate to provide shalom, peace, for men and women who have a broken relationship with a holy God. Right? So cool. So what's really important, if you're a note taker, I've given you some three fill-ins. And the first one is get the right house. Let me explain what I mean. One time when I was younger, I took a bicycle ride with some friends, and we rode from New York City out onto Long Island. If you know anything about Long Island, we went way out past Islip on bicycles. Yeah, I would never do that now. <laughs> Even if I was young and crazy, I wouldn't do it now. And um, we rode all the way out there to stay at a friend's house, and we had brought our tents and camping equipment, and we set up at our friend's house, we thought. And when we woke up in the morning and got up, there was a man raving at us. What are you doing on my front lawn? Blah, blah, blah. You really want to get the right house. <laughs> it's not fun when you get the wrong house. The reason I tell this is because I had that picture to see the temple and how 
we also build houses for worship. I'm going to show you now that second one. That is Wellington, South Africa, where Andrew Murray preached, who experienced revival. That is not the house of God. When God showed up, what matters? When Jesus shows up, then it's the house of God. There are tons of church buildings around that he's never invited into. And sometimes even us good guys don't invite him in. Yes, the old temple was glorious. Yes, places where God has touched down in churches and, and church buildings, some of them are glorious. But it's really God's house and his glory when Jesus shows up. Now, can I just say something? Because we're looking into the future. Uh, th that's been my passion and one of my drum beats since I've been here is where is the church going to go and what are we going to do for ministry into the future? There's something to be said for nice facilities. Can I put it that way? There's something to be said for that. If you're trying to do outreach and do a good job, you do the best that you can. You try to honor God with what you have, right? So I thought about that with Harmony. We've, we've uh, struggled with these older facilities, and I've thought about it, and I said this to our school team, our school board. We've got a new member on the school board sitting over here. Yay, Brandon. And, uh, yeah, he's helping us out with uh, technology and getting online and posting stuff and everything I wouldn't ever try. <laughs> and um, I thought about it, and I said, you know, Anybody ever notice our, our bathroom facilities when you come in here? They are sweet. I don't know if that's the right word for a bathroom, but sweet. And, uh, you know, if the rest of the facility, if we could bring it up to a third of that quality, we'd be rolling. You know, if God's keep telling you to keep this building long term, then honor God with it, right? I think that's, I think that's appropriate. Not because God needs glass cathedrals, he doesn't. He just needs places where people feel safe, where they feel clean, where their, their kids are in a nursery that they feel safe. There are some things like that. Our tech and, uh, what am I thinking of, um, security team needs to rethink and change. So be open to some changes in the future to get about it. All that said, I want to go back to my statement. Get the right house, because that beautiful church building in Wellington, South Africa, is not God's house. It was one day when Jesus showed up in the place, and I couldn't resist when I was there. I went in and touched the pews, and like they had a revival here. Andrew Murray preached here. Woo! I got up on his platform, you know. Hey. You know, you like sports figures. My fan, I'm a fan of other guys, all right? That's, and uh, God touched down there. And by the way, there was still a young group of uh, worship leaders on, singing spiritual songs up. They were practicing for the next service. So God still got a witness there. It was pretty cool. It was kind of fun. That's the first thing. Get the right house. Because here's what the Bible t says about the right house. I won't read through all of it because uh, Brother Tim pre uh, read it earlier in the worship time. From Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 18, where Simon Peter answers, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Isn't that a wonderful last name? Son of Jonah, right? Yeah, Bar, Ben, Ben Hur, son of Hur, Bar Jonah, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Remember, I've said before, God doesn't have grandchildren, right? The Holy Spirit gives us apprehension that Jesus is the unique God man and that we need him to save us. The lights come on. He's saying to, to Simon, You're getting this. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but the Holy Spirit did. My Father sent him to give this to you. And I also say to you, you're Peter. And there's a little play on words here. The name means a stone. And upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not overpower it. I will build my, my what? Yeah, that's God's house. Next verse backs it up. Ephesians chapter 2. 
verses 19 through 22. So then you're no longer, when you enter in, by the way, can I pause for one second? I know you're, you're wanting to read that, but, but just listen for a second. When he said, blessed are you, Simon, you get this. What is the rock he's building his church on? It's his profession of faith. It's not Peter. On this statement you just made that you understand that God has invaded human history to rescue us both Jews and Gentiles, on that basis, I'm going to build my church. Personally appropriated brings me into the kingdom of heaven, brings me into the true faith, into the true family of God, the true house of God. One of the side benefits of the COVID drama has been working outside of the building if you have to, because it's not about the building. So here it says, so you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit, a dwelling, a temple. God's house, the holy temple. Who's being built together? Not masonry, not wood, not pews. The saints. Every church in America could be burned down tomorrow, will not erase the temple of God. It will not erase the church. They'll still be out there somewhere. And there are places where that has happened, right? where the church has been persecuted. Remember, it's a tool. A building is a tool, and we can use it to the glory of God, or we can dispose. Whatever we have to do, what we have to do is follow the master Jesus. What is he doing to build his household, a dwelling of God in the spirit? Okay, so now here comes the preaching part. So I moved into a condominium, and uh, I, I like it. I do, I like it. But when you live with other people in closer community, it's not the same as when you live out in the country like I used to. And uh, so you have uh, big trash bins and you have recycling bins and then you have people who ignore the bins. You know, here's the trash can, here's the open door, here's the trash. What? Oh, it was just too hard to pick it up, put it, uh, whatever. And I don't know everybody's context, but I love it when a car pulls out and they don't even put ashtrays in your cars anymore because of this very issue. You ever have a car pull out and there's the pile? Don't you hate that? Don't you just hate stuff like that? Well, yeah. Now, this is a totally fleshly human reaction to a very small problem, really, in comparison to global issues. But there's this temptation in me to go, gee, thank you so much if I see it. Thank you so much for making my, my neighborhood trashy. I was going to say a toilet, but that's how they treat it because the rest of the world is their trash bin as far as they care, because nobody else matters, because they're so self-centered. Oh, by the way, that's because human beings are sinners left to ourselves. Have you, have you noticed that? Yeah, including us. Thanks be to God for the transformational work of the Holy Spirit. If anybody in this room litters, I'm coming after you. I'm just, just so, just wanna be clear about my priorities, okay. Well, you get the point. You get the point. This is my neighborhood. I have to live here. How do you think God feels about people who trash his church? I think he has even stronger feelings than what I just described. Whether it's trashing a church behind his back, verbal, that's why you never hear me trashing other churches and other pastors. And there's some that might deserve it. but I think my master in heaven instructs me to do otherwise. But it's not just talking, it's how we act. If we're part of a local assembly, are we cleaning up or leaving a mess? Are we helping to build up 
Or are we wearing the facility, the facility, the people? Are we wearing the kingdom work out? You get, you get what I'm saying? Only you can answer that. You have to process, what am I doing to help? Or what am I doing that's not helping, perhaps? But that's, that's the preaching part. I'm done. Now on to the next question, right? The next point. First one is make sure you get the right house. The real house of God is his people. And how many times I think people have been wounded because somebody, some crabby old deacon or something in a church was mad because a kid made a mark on the wall. That's God's house. And there's a permanent wound and a sense of disapproval. God hates me and doesn't like me and whatever. We got it all wrong. You know what? Now, now that I'm, you know, you're, you're, all, you're all okay? You okay? Yeah. Everybody good? Yeah. I, I was, okay. <laughs> I, was, I was, my wife will remember. We moved from Tucson, Arizona to, to uh, back to New York State years ago. And we had four kids at the time. Drove across in a van that kept shutting down on us. And then I went back to get all my stuff, which I had, I, don't ever do this. I've said this one other time in my tenure here. So let me just remind you, don't ever buy your own moving van. Don't ever buy your own moving van. So I bought it. And I had all my stuff packed in it. And it threw a rod two times coming across the country. Two times. Once is enough, don't you think? But see, God knew I needed more sanctification than most of you. So, no, we're going to do this twice. The first time was in Bessemer, Alabama. So we broke down, whittled our way, and got it pulled in somehow. I don't remember whether we got it towed in. We found a big church, because there's lots of big churches in the South, with a big parking lot, and we pulled it in and thought, these are brothers. You know, they'll let us get situated and try to fix this and get out of here. My first contact with one of the brothers who came up, tossed his cigarette and said, what's this doing here? And started yelling at me. Uh, you know, not yelling, but really talking harsh, like you're messing up our parking lot here. I said, I talked to Brother Jimmy inside. He's the pastor, Brother Jimmy. Yeah, well, he's got to talk to me because I'm one of the deacons. I'm deacon so-and-so. And I'm really glad I forgot deacon so-and-so's name so I wouldn't keep him on my prayer list. <laughs> you see what I mean about getting the house wrong? You get the wrong house. The other thing you get wrong is the wrong spirit. So let's look at the next point. Get the right spirit, the work of the Holy. Have I messed up our camera work? It's one of my gifts. <laughs> we good? Thank you, brothers, for putting up with me in the back. You all were, are going to get extra gems in your crowns just because you had to deal with me. Get the right spirit. What is the right spirit? The real glory in any church, which is the people, but wherever they meet becomes the church, right? They gather together. It's a temple of God. The real glory is when Jesus shows up. We need his touch. We've been talking about that over this last year. We need a touch. We need to be praying into a visit of the spirit of God. We need a touchdown of the spirit of God. Stop selling yourself short thinking, wow, this person, and thank God there's some good stuff happening when people get stuff. Lights come on, people break through to some freedom, somebody enters into life, they accept Christ into their, I just got, you know, I don't know what kind of people I got working for me, but I get a, I get an, a, a text from one of my pastors, I won't mention which one, Tim, but, you know, somebody made a profession of faith last night. Yay, we got to fill the baptistry. Who's crazy like that, you know? <laughs> People who love Jesus and want to see the kingdom go forward. And I think that person's in the room, but I won't embarrass anybody. Praise the Lord, right? Amen. And that's what you want. But think of how much more the Spirit could do. We need a deeper work, and so we need to pray for that. What's in the way? What holds us back? I've had people asking me, since I've said several times, and I've had several of us ask me, um, 
We're not used to hearing the voice of the Spirit. Or we're not, in fact, next week's discipleship class is going to be about that. But hearing the Spirit, how, how do I do that? And um, there's a number of things to do or to think about or pray through, whether that's what's in the way. But I'm going to tell you what I think the biggest thing is. Is that all right? I'm going to tell you what I think the biggest thing is. I think it's what Haggai is talking about in verse 4. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Think about this. Think about what's wrong. How come your stuff is so important, mine isn't? That's what God's asking, right? And Mr. Uh, Schofield put the question out there properly, saying, isn't this right that seek first the kingdom and his righteousness is appropriate for every generation? And it really is. Every time I'm finding opposition in my life and difficulty, I don't mean that God just magically takes every difficulty away from me, but the first place I go is into the presence of God, stay there long enough to listen and say, okay, where am I messing? What am, am I off track on something? Am I off track? Don't just assume, oh, of course I, I, you know, of course I love the Lord. Don't just assume it. Check. check. Am, how, how, what is, does my time reflect that? Does my activity reflect that? Does my checkbook reflect that? Is, is God first? And if, if he is first, then I lay all of my guilt and hang-ups with him, and I press on happy as a clam. And I don't know how happy clams are, but... I think they're pretty happy. That's why I keep telling you the Christian life is fun. Here's what it says. New Testament version of Haggai chapter 1. For all these things the Gentiles seek after. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. The, 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 yeah, those. First day with my new mouth. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and what you're worrying about will be added to you. Isn't that one of our biggest hang-ups? We don't believe that God has our best interests at heart, so we're going to make sure we take care of it. Then that's in the way. It's in the way. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough junk. Trust me. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you should have seen today. Wait till tomorrow. <laughs> Who has more fun than people, my wife always says. God bless you guys. I love you. You know that? Uh, seek first his kingdom. Let's look at it from another angle. Because sometimes it's because we're freaking. You know, we're, oh, I got to take care of it. I better do something. I, I, I find that around here. People who are like constantly trying to help God out because he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> you need to do this. You need, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I don't need to do this. God's got it. The Holy Spirit will lead. If I'm supposed to do it, I'll hear it. Maybe someone else is supposed to do it. And guess what? I waited for the other person to do it. He was the perfect person to do it. Okay, I know. I'm reining in my ADD. Let's look at it from another. One is our worry. We're not sure we can trust him. Hebrews was all about that, wasn't it? Casting all your cares upon him. Here's what it says. 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Hard to believe, right? But he does. Yes, sir. I don't want to derail you, but... Maybe you should. I feel like... Yeah. It's societal, and I think I'm, I'm so guilty of this sometimes where I forget that the way I engage with people in society is a reflection on all of you and a reflection on God. Oh. And Oof. so, like, if I'm, giving, if I'm yelling at somebody on Facebook, that reflects on all of you and reflects on him. Thank you for saying that. And Yeah. Ow. 
Yeah, God knew that our culture was going to unravel. I hate to fill you in on that. He didn't fall off his throne. When, when the onslaught of the Capitol happened, he didn't say, I'm done, I resign. He's not like Hawko, you know. Ow. But he didn't give up. He's got this. Do you understand what I'm saying? And thank you for that, because we're like the, the animal nature comes out, right? When animals are afraid, what do they do? Right. So that was well said, and it's going to tie in to my last point. You come up and preach it. I've got my notes right here. Come on. No, Mike. Here's the other thing with humble yourself. So the first one is out of our fear and our, uh, our, our trouble with unbelief. We have a hard time trusting that God has my best interests at heart. You know, I've got to marry this woman. I've got to. Not me. I'm making that up. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I've I, got, got, oh, got to make sure this happens. No, he's got your best interests at heart. Why don't you wait and do it his way, what the Bible says, and see what happens? That's the right way. He's got your best interests at heart. If you're his child, you're the apple of his eye. This other one, humble yourselves, implies something else. That's what you were touching on a little, because some of us are just plain stubborn. Yeah? Oh, stupid is a good word, too. Sure, yeah, I heard that. I get a witness. Uh, I get a witness. Yeah. Some of us are just plain stubborn. And, and, uh, and you know what? The way of the transgressor is hard. That's what Proverbs says. And so we have to, and I, I never wanted to do that. I think one of the reasons God has been merciful to me, not because I'm better than anybody in this room, but I didn't want to learn lessons the hard way. I saw enough people get their heads bashed in by the finger of God. I'm not kidding. I decided I ain't going to learn that way. If God says this is what I should, I'm going to do it because I'm a weenie and I like his favor. And his discipline scares me. All right, I'll stay on track. I could quote my wife on that one. Honey, I owe you one. She's listening right now. Mwah, mwah. Anyway. She is on. Because that means my family's watching, too. So, all right. Have the right spirit. The right house. Make sure you're talking about the right house and you're building the right house. Make sure you have that right spirit, which is, one, I seek first the kingdom. Just make up your mind about it. Uh, Gene and I have talked a lot. We, we shared a book in our, our staff and elder time. We're reading through a book called Calvary Road. I highly recommend it by Roy Hessian. Uh, I see some of you writing it down. I recommend it. Um, it's basically talking about dying to myself, to my flesh. I want, I want, I want. Me, 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 me. And I, I got to defend myself. No, I didn't mean that. that. No, you got me wrong. Everybody else is wrong. I'm always right. Right? Anybody know people that you married to any? Okay, you know what I mean. Right? We know what that's like. And God says, you know, just make up, and I love to say this, why are Christians miserable? Because they won't let go. I always say this, and I mean this in the right spiritual way. Just hurry up and die already. Get it over with. Kill that wicked thing called your flesh. Put it to death and decide, I'm going to live for Jesus from now on. It doesn't mean you know everything. It doesn't mean you're perfect. But from the moment you commit like that, you're a free agent. You can start walking in freedom. I see one brother over here shaking, and I hear an amen over there. And uh, recently a sister walked into some freedom in that, right? And so we need to hear that. There's freedom. So when it says humble yourselves, that's part of what it's saying. Stop being stiff-necked. Follow me. Last thing I want to say about having the right spirit. If I seek the kingdom first, if I get that square one right, then it frees the Holy Spirit to work. You remember that famous religious picture of Jesus standing at the door? Yep. And it's really not one of my favorite pictures, you know, it's the artwork. I, I think I might like anime a little better. But anyway, he's, he's knocking on the door, 
I know now I'm, now everyone says, hey, boy, it's a good thing he's leaving, holy cow. You know what that means, right? I've told you this before. We use that verse. It's from Revelation. I stand at the door and... And we use that for salvation, which it's not talking about. It's talking, Jesus is talking to the seven churches of the book of Revelation. He's standing outside the door of his own church, knocking, saying, would you please let me in? The glory happens when Jesus comes to church. We don't want him in because we don't want to seek the kingdom. For Is it right for you to deal with your paneled houses while my house, remember which house I mean, while my house lies in ruin? No wonder the Holy Spirit won't touch down. I've got to make up my mind. I really want, I want the carrot. I want to nibble on that carrot. I don't know about you. That's what I want. I guess I've taken to some preaching today, huh? Sorry. So, here's the last verse I want. Let me, let me agitate the troops with this one. You think you've been meddling downstairs. You ain't seen nothing. Wait do you see this one. This is in the Bible. No yeah, this verse is in the Bible. Galatians 3, 5, from the New Jerusalem version. I thought this was a good way to write it. Would you say then, brothers and sisters, that he who so lavishly sends the Spirit to you and causes the miracles among you, is doing this through your practice of the law or because you believe the message you heard? I've been doing a little sniffing around. I found that a lot of people, I think, come out of churches and their version of Christianity is a bunch of do's and don'ts. Churches should look this way. Oh, that church has drums. They're sinners. You know, that church over there, they let coffee in the sand. They're sinners. Did you talk to Jesus about that? Because why don't you ask his opinion? Maybe he has an opinion about it. Maybe he thinks you're wrong. Do you follow what I'm saying? It doesn't matter what the issue is. We've got this standard that it's not. So how about a little of this? How about a few miracles? Wouldn't that be cool? Oh, yeah, I know. That's for the, that's for the apostolic generation only. That's, no. <laughs> Boy, if you can't tell I'm being sarcastic after all these years, Donna. Okay, no. I'm, <laughs> great question. No. Yeah, that's one of the places where Schofield and I part ways, okay? Great preacher, great man. Used to preach right down the street from my church in Flushing, as a matter of fact, I found out, at a Presbyterian church. Good man. Good instruction. Still gleaning from his Bible. I love it. But the arm of the Lord is not shortened. The Holy Spirit has lost his stuff, as one famous preacher once said. He hasn't lost his stuff. I want the Spirit to move. Don't you want to see some movement of the Spirit among us? More people stepping into freedom. More works of transformation. More people getting born again. The real glory shows when Jesus shows up. But unfortunately, in many, many churches, he is not invited. He better come in with the clothes we say he better wear and not pick up a cup of coffee on the way in. By the way, I'm not harping on coffee. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. It really doesn't. Let's get the last point in here. Get, make sure you get the right church. We definitely need to have the right spirit. So we keep praying for a touchdown of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Keep praying this year. Don't be put off by COVID. It's going to end. You know, thanks be to God. <laughs> One way or the other, <laughs> it's going to end. Thanks be to God. And number three, get the right people. Oh, boy, now I'm going to meddle, and I've gone overtime, and you know what? I'm not stopping. Get the right people. Listen, look at this verse in Haggai chapter 2, verse 7. And I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations. I will shake the nations, and they'll bring their glory into my house, and I will fill this house with glory. What is he talking about? That book, Zechariah, others, 
all of them from the time they re rebuilt this temple after, the, uh, after coming back from the exile, speaks about the nations streaming to the house of God. What house? Not Jerusalem, all you prophecy conferences and all these preachers hung up about moving to Israel. Give it up. The house is the house of the living God, the church of Jesus. The nations will throng to it. It's happening. Africa, South America, China, thousands upon thousands, millions of people professing faith. We're the hard soil, brothers and sisters. We're the place you can't grow a stinking potato. But there are a few that are going to receive. And that's why we're still here. Otherwise, God could just take us home. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I will shake the nations and fill this house with glory. They will come. And that's why, and our brother Tim is going to revamp my original idea of pray for one, because we need to keep that on the burner as well. And it's hard to do, brothers and sisters, but we need to. Because there are people who need to know Jesus. And there are some who are hungry and ripe. Not most. It's, this is hard soil. By the way, I come, I'm a transplant, right? And I've had other colleagues tell me, this is hard soil in this area. It really is. But I have a feeling God wants to save a few people. Or maybe more than a few. Maybe like Donna's prayer request. Pray for 100. I want to show you something. In the, in the New Testament, Jesus is telling a parable, and he's dealing with Pharisees a lot, right? Remember, who are the Pharisees? They're the Bible-thumping church people. I'm just telling you who they are. We don't like that? Sorry. That's who they are. And so there's a story he tells about a, a, a Lord who says, I'm going to fill my house with a great banquet, and he invites all of the children of, it's really a picture of the Pharisees, of the children of Israel, to come to that banquet. And you know what happened? Oh, hey, you know what? I just got married, so I can't come to your dinner. Really? That's what marriage does to you? You can't go eat? <laughs> I, just, I just bought a new pickup truck, and I got to try it out. And I know it's oxen. I know what the Bible says, all right? But the point is, I'm busy. I got this going on, you know, so I can't come. Really? You couldn't test drive it later? And on and on and on. Millions of reasons. So here's how this, the text goes. This is a big pile of text here. The slave came back and reported to his master. The head of the household became angry, and rightfully so, and said to his slave, I'm preparing this banquet. I'm preparing glory for my children, and they're telling me, go drop Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in here poor, crippled, blind, and lame. The slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there's room. Master said to the slave, Go out into the highways along the hedges and compel them to come in. Compel them to come in. He doesn't mean twist or threaten, okay? No twisting arms or threatening. That's not the point. Encourage them that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Whoa. The Bible, the New Testament, all over the Gospels, Jesus repeats this kind of theme over and over and over, right? The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Here's an exhortation for you. Stop wasting your time with stubborn Christians who don't give a rip about following Jesus and go after those who are hungry. Christians waste more time trying to drag people screaming and kicking back to church. They've heard. They've heard. Remember what Jesus said in the story of Lazarus? They have Moses and the prophets. They've heard the Bible. They've despised me. They're sticking their tongue out. Go to the lost sheep who are hungry. I don't mean you never have that assignment. The Holy Spirit may tell you, go after this turkey. You know, he may say that. Go after him, pester the snot out of him. Okay, I'm all right with that. If you're sure the Holy Spirit told you, but let me tell you, we waste too much time trying to rearrange labels on bottles. 
we move people from this church to that church and that church to this church and this church. We're not, we're not building the kingdom. We're wasting our time. I can't put it any more viciously than that. Put one-third of that effort into connecting with some non-believing neighbor or workmate or somebody and see what happens, right? I'm glad when people are hungry for any of this going forward. Brother Brian told me that somebody who came to our food pantry asked for a Bible. That's a win. Somebody's professed faith. That's a win. Somebody got some freedom in their life a couple of weeks ago. That's a win. We want the right house. We want the right spirit. And we want to go after the right people. And reaching out, praying for one or a hundred, that's hard work. We don't make it happen. God has to make it happen. But we need to obey. We need to be available. We need to put the kingdom first. And we need to pray, right? So may God bless us as we move into the future. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to close in prayer. And it looks like God's been good to us. You'll all go home safely. Amen to that, right? Hopefully this was not one of those boring sermons that my brother exhorted us about earlier. Help us, King Jesus. You're good. You loved us. You drew us. Somebody shared the good news with us. And we're here because of it, and we know our lives are, have been changed or are being changed. Well, we want to drag a few others with us. And we don't want to drag them screaming and kicking. We want to invite them in because your spirit has already spoken and moved them. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So we're praying now, Father, that you would be drawing people into life eternal, that you would... Turn our necks to look in the right direction to put your kingdom first and that we would always have clearly in our house that this facility is only a tool for glorifying you and building your kingdom. And that's it. The house is your people and may we never trash it. Help us in the great name of Jesus and all of God's people said amen and amen. God bless you. Have a